So first off, somebody asked me if I could go back. I know I said a few things before I started the recording. So just to just to briefly touch on that all again. Remember that the derivative of a position function is velocity. The derivative of a velocity function is acceleration. Right? And so integration or integrate integral of acceleration gives you velocity, and integral of velocity gives you displacement. Um, so um, next thing was speed. Speed is always the absolute value of velocity because speed has no direction to it. So if I'm moving to the right or to the left, the speed is always positive. Whereas for velocity, if I'm moving to the right, the velocity is positive. But if I'm moving to the left, the velocity is negative or positive moving up and negative moving down. Um, and then the integral of speed gives you the total distance traveled whereas the integral of velocity gives you the displacement from where you started. Um, I think that's mostly what I sort of talked about there um, before, we, before we went through. Um, so let's, let's start looking at this one. So we've got the velocity of a particle, particle P, um, that's moving along the x-axis, so it's moving right and left, potentially, um, meters per hour, T is hours, and it gave us some values of the velocity um, for different t values. And it says that at the beginning, at time t equals zero, the particle is at the origin. So first off, given that this is a differentiable function, why must there be at least one time between 0.3 and 2.8 where the derivative of v, or the acceleration, is equal to zero? And so that's a, a mean value theorem for derivatives question. Um, so if you have a continuous differentiable function and any differentiable function is continuous, so we know this, this velocity function is both continuous and differentiable, that there must be a time right, where the derivative, where v prime of t is equal to the average rate of change. So I'm going to... I'll say v prime at c is equal to v of b minus v of a over b minus a for some c on the interval a to b. Um, so we know that that's, that's the mean value theorem. And we can see that if I were to take v of b, so v of 2.8 minus v of 0.3, divided by 2.8 minus 0 0.3, I get zero. And that tells me that somewhere on the interval between 0.3 and 2.8, the derivative of the velocity must equal zero. Um, therefore, the acceleration must be equal to zero. We know that that must occur somewhere on 0 0.3 to 2.8 by the mean value here. And that, let's see how many, they gave you two points for that. So one for showing this and one for your justification with the mean value here. I put the, the intermediate value theorem, the IBT. Can you explain why that is not applicable to this like specific problem? Yeah, the, the, uh, the intermediate value theorem doesn't work because the intermediate value theorem only talks about the function itself. It doesn't have anything to do with the derivatives of the function. Um, so if you tried to say that V changed signs from 55 to negative 29 somewhere on that yeah, interval, that just means exactly that the velocity was equal to zero sometime on there, but not that the acceleration would have to be. So mean value theorem says that the derivative or the the instantaneous rate of change equals the average rate of change on that interval somewhere. If it crosses the x-axis and hits zero, what does that mean that the, or never mind? No, a velocity of yeah, zero doesn't necessarily mean that the acceleration is zero. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, for this one on part A, mm -hmm. I like wrote a sign chart because if the velocity is decreasing, I basically just said because it's decreasing and then it goes to increasing. At some point, the acceleration is zero. 
or it goes decreasing to increasing. Um, yeah, so you could you could use that. Um, you're saying that because the velocity went from decreasing to increasing, that yeah yeah okay that 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 would work too um, yeah okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so if you, you can do that and say um, V of T is decreasing on 0.3 to 1.7, increasing on 1.7 to 2.8, therefore its derivative which equals A or V prime goes from negative to positive. And since we know that it's differentiable on the entire interval, the only way to go from negative to positive while still having your derivative exist is to have a critical value where it equals zero. And so if they didn't state that it was differentiable though, this wouldn't make it guaranteed because, uh, because then you could have a place where the derivative was undefined here, where it changed signs also. But since it's differentiable, that works. Yeah, so that would work. So what does the the mean value theorem, what does this specifically try to like prove? The, the mean value theorem says, I mean, it says this. It, it says that the average rate of change is equal to the instantaneous rate of change on the interval somewhere, as long as the function is continuous and differential. So effectively, it's saying that you got some function that's continuous and differentiable on some interval from A to B. It says that um, no matter what this average rate of change is between A and B, so as long as this function was continuous and differentiable, there must be some place C that is between A and B where the instantaneous rate of change or the slope of the tangent line is the same as the slope of the secant line, the slope of the line that goes through those two points. There must be at least one place so there's this one happens to have two right it looks like there's another one right about here there's two places on there but there's guaranteed if the function is continuous and differential on the interval to be at least one place for the average rate of change on the interval or the slope between a and b is equal to the instantaneous rate of change of the function so the slope of the tangent line okay thanks is that good? Everybody good there? With, uh, and then it has to be continuous and differentiable. Like yeah, those are the continuous, okay. yeah, and differentiable on that. And it has to be continuous on the closed interval, and it has to be dif differentiable at least on the open interval. Uh, okay. Yeah. And the 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 guarantee is that it must. So when you say it's guaranteed to happen at least once. And they, it must be on the open interval that it happens. And if you if they ask, well, why was it true on the closed interval? That's fine, because if it's true on the open interval, it must be true on the closed interval as well. And you're just adding an extra point there at the end. So, everybody good there or no? Okay. And if you were using this justification um, or, or this justification, either justification, make sure you mention that it's a differentiable function. Because um, otherwise, if it's not differentiable, that isn't guaranteeing one, that it's continuous, and two, it's not guaranteeing that this derivative couldn't be undefined at this place where this minimum occurs. So just be careful with that. Make sure you're very explicit about it. All uh, right. Um, part B says use a trapezoidal sum with three subintervals, 0 to 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to 1.7, 1.7 to 2.8, to approximate the value of the integral from 0 to 2.8 of v. So since these subintervals, 0 to 0.3 and 0.3 to 1.7 and 1.7 to 2.8 are not equal subintervals, you can't just use the trapezoidal formula. You have to just go in and find the area of each trapezoid separately. So we'll say that this integral should approximately be equal to using a trapezoidal sum, the height of the first trapezoid, which is 0.3, times the first base, zero, plus the second base, 
55 divided by 2. That one happens to just be a triangle, but one half base times height, same thing. And then the next one should have a length of one point or height of 1.4, 1 1.7 minus 0 0.3, 55 plus negative 29 over 2 as your two bases. Um, and then your last one, 2.8 minus 1.7, ought to be 1.1. And once again, that one should be 55 minus 29 over 2 as well. And you just will put all of that nonsense together, all of that arithmetic. And I mean, you had a calculator, so that should have been pretty straightforward, but it should be either way. 40.75 is what that came out to be. Any questions there on part B? I feel like that part should have been pretty easy. And you just get one point for the final answer there. So just remember that if you are asked to do a trapezoidal sum, that if the subintervals are equal, which these are not, you can just use the formula. But if the subintervals are not equal, if you have unequal subintervals, you have to just do each trapezoid separately. Okay, sounds like everybody's good with that one. So part C, part C says we've got a second particle also moving along the x-axis. We're given its velocity. This time we're given an actual function rather than a chart. Um, and we want to first find the time interval during which the velocity of particle Q is at least 60. And um, so in order to figure out when it's at least 60, so basically we're looking for when is, when is v sub q of t greater than or equal to 60. Um, first thing we want to do is figure out when it equals 60, and then we can just do a sign chart to see when its velocity is more than that or less than that. And since you've got a graphing calculator for this one, for part C, we're just going to set v sub q of t equal to 60. Um, and graph that, and that gives you points of intersection of those two functions. Or you can subtract 60 and look for x-intercepts. If you want to do it that way, v sub q of t minus 60 equals 0. Either way, I'll get the same t values of 1.866181 and 3.5. One nine one seven four. Good. Everybody okay with that? You should be able to do that on your uh, calculator pretty easily. And then you would just look at well, when is the function greater than sixty? So when was v of v sub q of t a larger number than sixty? Or when was v sub q of t minus 60 greater than zero? And that would be between these two values. So you would um, you would say that it was from t is less than or equal to 3.519, greater than or equal to 1.866. So that's the first part of part uh, C, which was worth one point. Any questions on how to do that? I just use interval notation. Would that have been fine as well? Yeah, that's fine. Like with okay. yep. brackets, parentheses. Either way is always fine. They don't care. They don't uh, unless it specifies. Which I mean, I think I've seen one question in the last twenty years where they specified to like write it in interval notation. They, um, either way is fine. You could even write it. I mean, you could write it out in words. You could say between. 1.86 t equals 1.866 and t equals 3.519. I mean, you write it all out in words, that's fine also. So they're not picky about that. All right, and the second part of it says, find the total distance traveled by the particle during the interval when the velocity is at least 60. So that means we are looking for the total distance traveled on that interval that we were just looking at. And so if we're looking at the total distance traveled, total distance 
that should be equal to the integral. And I'm just going to call these A and B so that I don't have to rewrite those values. A and B here should be the absolute value of the velocity. Right? Displacement from 1.866 to 3.519 is the integral from A to B of the velocity function. But total distance is the integral of the absolute value of the velocity. Okay? Um, and so on your calculator, you would just type in this integral. Um, and you'd make sure to put the absolute values inside the integral on it. And you would get a number, which would be 106.109. And I don't know, I think it was meters, I think, were our units. Where's the absolute value in the calculator? Like, how do you input that? Um, just hit math. And I believe okay. in the very first column, I think it is choice number one there. It just says ABS parenthesis usually. Or for older calculators, it says ABS parenthesis. For some of the newer ones, it has the actual absolute value sign. So it's like I believe fraction. It's the, what? It says um, it's in the second. number category. Uh, maybe it's, it's, yeah, it's a couple oh, columns okay. over. I think it's still option number one in one of those columns. Okay, yeah, so make sure you know how to get absolute value on your graphing calculator. Um, so then they gave you for this, so that was one point earlier, one point for the setup with the absolute value on your integral, and one point for the final answer, the total distance traveled. I didn't put the absolute value, but I still got the same answer. Would I get that, that second point still? So yes, most likely. Um, but you would want to, um, I mean, okay, so, so here's where it's a little bit difficult for me to sort of interpret. They put the absolute value on it. You should put the absolute value on it if you're not sure if the velocity is always positive, because if the velocity is always positive on the interval you're integrating, well, the absolute value then is redundant, which is what the case is here, because we were looking for wind velocity was greater than or equal to 60. Clearly, if the velocity is greater than or equal to 60, it's always positive. So they're redundant. Um, and I think that if you didn't put them, that you'd still be fine. But suppose that this question just said, what is the total distance traveled by the particle from 0 to 4? And for some time on that interval, the velocity was negative, and you didn't put the absolute value, you would get the wrong answer from the calculator. So, um, I think that on this one, because it was pretty clear that the velocity was always positive, you're fine. With both me, points. What? With both points. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And and I think what what do you mean with both points? Like both points that you'd be getting here, one and two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying not, not with these, because it doesn't matter if the velocity is positive here and positive here. We got to make sure it's positive on the entire interval. To not I was referring to the second, the distance one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So just just be careful with that. Um, and anytime it asks for total distance traveled, I mean, just to be safe, just throw it inside absolute values, even if you're positive that the particle's velocity is always positive on that interval, because um, then you're guaranteed to get it, because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and uh, I was going to say something else. Uh, lost my train of thought there about that. Just make sure you get the absolute value on it if it's looking for total distance traveled. Or if you're not going to put it because you know it's always positive, right? That you, know, you could write a little thing over here v, v sub q of t equal or is greater than or equal to 60 on the interval a to b. So absolute value of v sub q of t is just equal to v sub q of t. And then you just put it in as just the non absolute value, but it's easier to just draw those two lines. <laughs> so, good or no? Yeah, good. All right. Um, so then we got part D here. Part D says at time t equals zero, particle Q, which is the particle from this fun little equation we got here, um, is at a position of x equals negative 90. Um, and then using our result from part B and the function that we were given for V sub Q and part C, approximate the distance between the particles um, at time 2.8. So 
So first thing we need to do is go back to part B and say, where is our, um, where is our particle P? So particle P started at zero and had a displacement of 40.75. So we will say that the position of particle P at 2.8 should be 40.75, which is our zero plus the displacement. Right? Um, and then our position of particle Q at 2.8 should be the displacement from zero to 2.8. So not the total distance traveled, but the displacement, and then plus our initial condition. Our initial condition was it started at negative 90 when it was at zero, and then we will add to that the integral from zero to two of just V sub Q of T dt without the absolute value, because we want to know, sorry, zero to 2.8. We want to know that the displacement, where it is, the position, rather than the total distance that it traveled. Everybody good with that? Doesn't the problem specify that they want distance, not displacement, though? Is the that problem, not? The problem says that they want the distance between the particles. Well, the distance between the particles is, you know, the position of Q minus the position of P. So in order to find okay. the distance between them, you need the position. Oh, so you're finding, okay, I get it now. You're finding yeah, find the, position. the position of each of them and then just find the difference to find. Them. I see. So, so this is the position of P. The position of Q is, um, that came out to be 45.93. And so to find the distance between them, just <laughs> doesn't matter which one you subtract first, but take the absolute value of it because the distance between them distance is always positive and it comes out to be 5.188 meters and that one was worth three points so one point for including this integral from zero to 2.8 one point for including the negative well actually one point for making sure you did the negative 90 and correctly getting this value and then one point for being the correct for final value so just make sure you don't forget about the initial position of particle Q at, at uh, T equals zero, the position was negative 90. You have to add that to the displacement from zero to 2.8. Everybody good there with that one? Yeah. Any questions there? Cool. All right, we're going to move on to another one. So we won't have time to go through this one today, but I do want you guys to spend the 15 minutes right now working on it so that I know that it's done before tomorrow. Um, and then I'll assign you two or three more to do tonight that we can right away talk about on Thursday um, after we do the, the differential equations stuff. So we're going to do this one. I'm going to give you 15 minutes and then we'll close up after that.